Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 79, A Mother's Love. Last time, we saw the impressive Empress Irene rule alone for seven years, despite all of Roman history suggesting she wouldn't be able to. She promoted eunuchs to run her administration, she brought swathes of Thrace back into the empire, and she overturned the iconoclast council of 754. This was success beyond the wildest dreams she might have had when she was just an imperial princess. The power was intoxicating, and because a woman wasn't supposed to rule, she was constantly on edge trying to stay a step ahead of any opposition. The Byzantine emperor was always a busy person, but it seems likely that in order to maintain power, Irene focused on work to the exclusion of her responsibilities as a mother. I'm not condemning her for that, as doubtless many male emperors had done the same. But she was meant to be the regent. She was supposed to educate her son in the ways of ruling so that he could take over one day. She did take him on those two tours of Thrace, but it seems as if her love for him could not compete with the allure of absolute power. As he approached adulthood, she became more reticent to prepare the ground for the succession. He was not brought into the big meetings, he was not given any formal responsibilities, and he was not sent on campaign alone. Tension was building at court, Those who owed their career advancement to Irene wanted to maintain the status quo. But those on the outside, looking for promotion and preferment, wanted Constantine to rise. In the end, the mother's love of power would destroy both of them and their dynasty. In 787, Constantine had turned 16, and word had been sent to Charlemagne that it was time to send his daughter Rotrude to Constantinople to become an imperial princess. But King Charles wouldn't comply. He had a reputation for refusing to let his daughters leave his side, either because of his affection for them or because he feared rival dynastic claims sprouting up. Irene was disappointed, but found her son a new wife anyway. The empress held a bride show to select a suitable candidate. This meant sending out officials into the provinces to select young girls who matched the necessary criteria, bringing them to the capital for them to audition. This is the first recorded use of a bride show which would become something of an imperial tradition. This was the moment when mother and son began to publicly fall out. The girl chosen was Maria of Amnia, a place near Gangra in central Anatolia. Constantine did not like her. We don't know why, but he was unhappy, and yet did not have the ability to say no to Irene's wishes. This impotence pushed him to seek allies at court who could help him gain the power that should have been his birthright. Irene pressed on with her plans for Byzantium, though. She had armies ready to operate on three different fronts over the next two years. But each would suffer disaster, and these poor results would undermine her position, allowing Constantine to finally emerge from her shadow. In the east, the truce with the caliphate had been broken, and so, as expected, Arab raids resumed in spring 788. The Anatolikon had prepared for this, and met a force which headed toward them through the Cilician gates. But the Arabs smashed the theme troops, routing them and raiding unchecked through the eastern provinces. Meanwhile, in Thrace, Byzantine forces had been sent to incorporate more territory back into the empire. This army made camp near the Strymon River, on the western edge of our map, well away from the Bulgar border. 
They had little fear of the Slavic tribes they were marching against, and so didn't post proper sentries. This was to be a fatal error. The Bulgars had been monitoring their movements and launched a surprise attack. The Romans suffered heavy casualties and fled south. Finally, with the marriage to Rotrude off, Irene began to worry again about the Frankish presence in Italy. She agreed to send the exiled Lombard prince Adelchis with a force from Sicily to try and shore up the Byzantine position in the south. This force marched to Benevento, where the last remaining Lombard kingdom survived, and tried to arrange an alliance against Charlemagne. Though eventually the two sides would become allies, the Lombards were at this stage more afraid of King Charles than the Byzantines. To demonstrate their loyalty to him, they hammered the Byzantine army and killed its commander. Within the ranks of the army, pressure was thus growing to oust Irene and elevate her son. The precedent set by Constantine V was very much in their minds. Let his grandson take charge and lead us to victory. For now, though, Irene went into damage control mode and repaired the situation. As I say, the Lombards did eventually agree to an alliance. In the Balkans, Irene ordered that a new theme be created to better defend the new western possessions in Thrace. The new army was named the Theme of Macedonia, which seemed to be a statement of future intent, because actual geographical Macedonia was much further west, well outside of imperial control. At the end of that year, 788, more good news seemed to come in the form of thousands of Armenian soldiers and their families fleeing poor treatment by the caliphate and seeking positions in the Byzantine army. Irene accommodated many of them, with the majority naturally joining the Armeniacon theme. Unfortunately for the empress, these new recruits would actually prompt the revolt, which was to end her sole rule. The following year, the now 18-year-old Constantine was ready to act. He seems to have always been fond of his mother, understandably, and perhaps that clouded his perspective on the true extent of her power. Because as he prepared to strike, it was not her that he targeted, but her chief minister, Stavrakios. Constantine had spent the last few years feeling humiliated that when petitions and pleas came to court, men headed straight for Stavrakios rather than him. He believed that the eunuch was the one hoarding power and preventing him from assuming his rightful place. Constantine was not wrong about the extent of Stavrakios's influence. Soon after the plot was hatched to get rid of him, Stavrakios was told by an informant what was happening. When Irene found out, she reacted with typical swiftness, having her son's entourage flogged and exiled. But she also revealed her own desperate desire to maintain power in a way which would undo her. Allegedly, she hit Constantine and had him placed under house arrest in his imperial apartments. To make sure that her position would be unquestioned, she gathered the Tachmata and demanded that they swear an oath of loyalty to her, and made them agree not to elevate her son while she was alive. These men knew the Empress's wrath well, and quickly complied. Representatives then headed out to Anatolia to receive the oaths of the theme troops. The startled soldiers went along with their commander's wishes, despite their misgivings. Only when the most distant troops heard news of this, the Armenia Khan, did pushback come. The soldiers there refused to take the oath. They were happy to swear their loyalty to the ruling dynasty, but it was to be Constantine and Irene for them, not the other way round. The empress dispatched a respected commander of the Tachmata, Alexius Musel, to talk them round. Alexius was of Armenian origin, and his family were well known in the region. So instead of being persuaded, the Armenia Khan elevated Alexius to be their new strategos, still refusing to obey Irene. 
When news of this reached the other themes, they followed suit, deposing the commanders that Irene had appointed and choosing their own. Several armies began to converge at Atroa, in the Opsikion theme, to await an imperial response. Irene met with the Tachmata, who told her that they weren't prepared to fight a civil war on her behalf. With a deep sigh, the Empress agreed to relent and released her son. Constantine rode out to Atroa to be acclaimed by the troops as sole ruler. He then marched back to the capital to be received by the crowds in November of 790. The young emperor ordered that Irene's two most powerful eunuch advisers be exiled. One was called Etios, and the other was, of course, Stavrakios. Stavrakios was sent to live with the Armenia Khan, who hated him, as assurance that Constantine really was in charge. He was even escorted there by Michael Lachanothrakon, the old general who had served Constantine V so well. Despite the appearance of a purge, though, Constantine actually did little to undo his mother's network of power. Most of the palace's employees remained in their posts and therefore maintained loyalty to her. The empress herself was not harshly punished for keeping her son from his inheritance. She was confined to the Eleutherius palace, which she'd built, but he didn't take away her wealth, nor even take her face off his coins. He still loved her and valued her advice. For now, though, the emperor had one thing on his mind, military victory. This is why the army had agitated for him, and of course he desperately wanted the legitimacy that would come with it. So in April 791, he led the army out toward the Bulgar frontier. Ready for him was the Khan Kardamos, and the two sides fought a bloody battle until night fell. Looking at his battered troops, Constantine decided to withdraw under cover of darkness rather than risk losing, and fortunately, Cardamos seems to have felt the same way. Having been disappointed in the west, Constantine looked east and spent the rest of the summer preparing to campaign there. By September, he had gathered a large force and was ready to attack the Syrian border. However, a very cold winter was slowly setting in, and with his supplies diminishing, the emperor was again forced to withdraw. Having failed to gain the victories he wanted, Constantine returned to the capital and was besieged by requests for Irene to be restored to her position. Perhaps feeling that his mother could handle domestic affairs while he was on campaign, he relented and allowed her back into the great palace. This seems like an extraordinary decision given her behaviour, but he clearly didn't believe she was working against him. And to some extent you can understand that. She needed him, after all. Without a male co-ruler, surely her position would be untenable. And she was his mother. And everyone in the palace had known him since he was young. You can see how he would mistake where people's real loyalties lay. Still, this decision was Constantine's undoing. His own supporters lost faith in him. Those who worked in the palace knew that he was handing control of their careers back to Irene. The extent of his naivety is demonstrated by the fact that early in 792 he agreed to recall Stavrakios from exile and restored him to his position. This decision outraged the men of the Armenia Khan, who refused to return to an oath of loyalty to Constantine and Irene. Their commander Alexius was in the capital at the time, and the emperor had him thrown in jail in response, but otherwise left their brewing rebellion to simmer. In the meantime, Constantine remained focused on gaining that military victory. Again he targeted Thrace, and spent the summer of 792 rebuilding the fortifications of the town of Markelai on the border. This was a sensible idea in theory, as it would help anchor future conflicts with the Bulgars, but the emperor had brought a lot of the trappings of the court with him, tents and musicians and hangers-on. 
I suppose the idea was to make the campaign into the kind of triumphal procession which his mother had taken him on a decade earlier. Once again, though, inadequate preparations were made for an attack from the north. Sure enough, Cardam appeared with the entire Bulgar host and the Romans panicked, packing themselves inside Marcelli. The emperor was trapped. If he marched out to fight, he would probably lose. The Bulgars had already scouted the terrain and were better prepared. But if he retreated, his reputation would suffer almost as badly. Choosing the worst of all options, the emperor launched a surprise attack without proper military advice, and his army was badly mauled. Realising that he was in the midst of a rout, Constantine escaped the battlefield and made it back to the capital. Many others did not. Innocent courtiers were trampled to death, the commanders of the themes of Thrace and Macedonia were killed in the fighting, and worst of all, Michael Lachanothrakon was also killed. The emperor had overseen an utter disaster and looked cowardly in the process. The Tachmata, who accompanied him back to Constantinople, were disgusted with his ineptitude. A few of their number began plotting to have one of the sons of Constantine V, now all serving as priests, made emperor. Stavrakios and Irene got wind of this and went to advise the emperor. The five brothers were a danger to his rule and should be punished, despite their protestations of innocence. Nodding along, Constantine gave the order for his five uncles to be mutilated. Nicephorus, who had now been connected with three coup attempts, was blinded, while the others had their tongues cut out. While they were at it, Irene and her chief minister suggested that Constantine also blind Alexius Musel, the Strategos of the Armenia Khan. The troops had refused to swear an oath of loyalty. That was treason and given their past behaviour, surely there was a danger that they would elevate Alexius, a popular and experienced soldier, to be their emperor. Constantine agreed, and Alexius's eyes were put out. On the surface, this swift response to a crisis showed why Constantine felt the need to keep Irene and Stavrakios in position. Their knowledge of the political game was vital to maintaining his position on the throne. But the emperor had just alienated the one constituency that had supported his right to rule alone. If it wasn't for the army, he might still be languishing in the palace, with everyone else looking the other way as Irene continued to run the show. By mutilating the sons of Constantine V, he had distanced himself from the beloved boys that the soldiers had toasted the births of, and by blinding Alexius, he had betrayed the trust of the entire Armeniacon theme. When word reached them what had happened, they went into open revolt. Constantine ordered the Obsikion and Bacalarian themes to march east and put down the uprising, but the Armeniacon were strong defeated the converging armies and captured their commanders. They then had these men blinded in revenge for what had happened to Alexius. Constantine stewed over the situation during the winter, but by May 793 he gathered the other theme armies and overwhelmed the rebellious Armeniacs. A large contingent of native Armenian soldiers, who'd defected to the Byzantines only recently, remember, turned their backs on their comrades. They had no interest in dying for this cause and left the field. The ringleaders were executed and the thousand or so men who lived at the theme's headquarters were brought in chains to Constantinople. They were paraded in the Hippodrome and had the words Armeniacon Conspirator branded on their foreheads. Worse than all this, though, the Arabs were able to raid unchecked while this brief civil war unfolded. One force reached the fortress of Kamacha, the Byzantines' most eastern position, taken by Constantine V himself. 
The place was garrisoned by many of those native Armenians, who now turned coat again and handed the defences over to the Arabs. Holding a fort in Armenia had helped direct Arab raids along more predictable routes. It was a sad loss and further alienated the army from the emperor's cause. The question historians have been asking since is whether Irene deliberately suggested the blinding of Alexius in order to provoke a reaction against her son. We'll never know, but the whole episode thoroughly suited her purposes. The men of the administration, and now the army, had no reason to have faith in Constantine. The group who had been most loyal to him had just been squashed, whereas those loyal to Irene, like Etios and Stavrakios, were rich and fat back in the palace. If you were considering which of the heads of government to trust your career to, there was only one answer. Constantine was still emperor, though, and there was unlikely to be further rebellion against him. He did, however, manage to alienate yet another segment of Byzantine society. He continued to resent his wife Maria, who had by this time given birth to two of his children, both girls. The emperor had been having an affair with a local noblewoman from Irene's retinue, Theodoti. By 795, he was determined to divorce Maria and marry Theodoti. But imperial divorce was a very serious and public issue, and Maria had done nothing to justify this. Perhaps on deliberately bad advice from Irene or her advisers, he announced that Maria had tried to poison him. He had her forced into a convent, and she took her daughters with her. That summer, he managed to secure a sort of military triumph by crushing a small Arab raiding party with overwhelming force. It didn't exactly allow him the quantity of spoils he was looking for, but it was good news nonetheless. Buoyed by this victory, he married Theodoti that August. The only problem was he wasn't really allowed to marry her. He hadn't been granted an official divorce, and so many in the church seriously frowned on the impending nuptials. The patriarch Tarasios looked the other way and allowed him to marry her at the palace of St. Mamus, rather than in one of the major churches. The patriarch didn't preside either, but allowed a local abbot to perform the ceremony. The month-long wedding celebrations could hardly be kept secret, and despite general disapproval from the church, the event took place without incident. Eventually, though, protest came from the Sakudian Monastery. This was just over the Bosphorus in Bithynia, where two prominent monks, Plato and Theodore, announced their opposition to the Union. Not only were they unhappy with the emperor, but they excommunicated Tarasius for his part in it. This put many other churchmen in the awkward position of either coming out as enemies of the emperor and patriarch, or having to defend a pretty indefensible position. Eventually, the emperor had the monastery shut down and its leading men exiled, but this isn't the last that we'll hear of them. Again, modern historians wonder aloud whether Irene encouraged her son to enter this unlawful marriage for her own benefit. And with the church in discomfort and questioning the orthodoxy of their emperor, Constantine had managed to alienate them all. Bureaucracy, army, church. No one would stand up for him now. The following year, 796, Constantine led another unsuccessful campaign against the Bulgars. Cardam demanded tribute in exchange for peace, and the emperor made a big show by sending back horse excrement as his offering. He then led a large army to the border, but the Khan refused to give battle. He could see that the Romans would outnumber him, and so kept his forces in the forests. Constantine left frustrated again. 
During that summer, Irene realised that time was running out if she planned to depose her son and resume sole control of the empire. His new wife Maria was pregnant, and now seven years of campaigning meant Constantine was finally learning how to command. A major military victory could secure the army's loyalty, after all. That July, the whole court and the Tachmata headed out to Prusa in the Obsikion to enjoy the local hot springs. While there, news came that Theodoti had given birth to a boy back in Constantinople. The emperor raced home to be with his family, while the court remained at the springs with just Irene in command. She took the opportunity to speak with the commanders of the Tachmata about supporting her in a bid to retake power. The new baby, she pointed out, was born of an illegitimate marriage. But this argument was probably less persuasive than the heavy bribes she was handing out. No one acted immediately, though, and in spring 797, Constantine personally led an army to respond to an Arab raid in Cappadocia. Irene persuaded him to take Stavrakios with him, and agents of the eunuch falsely reported that the Arabs had retreated in the face of the Byzantines' arrival. Constantine headed home in irritation again, but that turned to fury when he learned that the Arabs had gone on plundering in their absence. Soon afterwards, his baby son died young, plunging the emperor into grief. He had no stomach to lead further campaigns that summer, and remained in the capital. Using this to her advantage, Irene ordered her supporters to imprison her son. Constantine's habit was to spend the hotter months of the year at his palace of St. Mamas, only returning to the capital to deal with very important business or to preside over games in the Hippodrome. After one afternoon's races, he began making his way to the harbour when soldiers attacked his entourage. In the confusion, the emperor ran for the imperial galley and ordered it to set sail. The ship crossed the Sea of Marmara to the fort of Pili, where Constantine paused to await news from the capital. All was confusion. Some of his bodyguard crossed the water to join him, and no one was sure exactly who was behind the attacks. The emperor remained deeply ignorant of the loyalties of those closest to him. Amongst his entourage were several of Irene's men. Back in the city, she was now frantic at the thought that her coup might be about to unravel. She sent men to the Emperor's camp to offer support, but once they'd arrived, they told Irene's supporters that surrounded the Emperor that if they didn't deliver Constantine to her, she would write to her son, revealing the truth about their loyalties. They acted quickly to save their own skin. They took the emperor unawares and bundled him back onto the imperial galley and sailed for the palace. Once there, they dragged Constantine up to the porphyry chamber where he'd been born 26 years earlier. His mother gave the order and they put her son's eyes out. There is some doubt about when Constantine died. Some reports say his injuries were so brutal that he died soon afterwards. Others imply that he lingered for a while and then died. Others still that he lived on for several years. Either way, he was out of the picture. And it could be that Irene did have him killed, only to spread rumours that he was still alive to bolster her claims to rule. He had ruled, sometimes alone, more often not, for seven years. Blinding your own child is a horrific act. We've heard about so much bloodshed on the histories of Rome and Byzantium that it can be hard to feel real emotion about them. Surely, this is an exception. I can't see a way in which this can be justified. We all know that a lot of brutal killings took place which had a certain necessity to them. To avoid civil war, 
Many innocent people have suffered horrible fates, and we have shrugged. But in this case, I don't see what Constantine did to deserve this. He wasn't running the empire into the ground, nor was he threatening Irene's position at all. He allowed her more power and freedom than any other imperial matron had enjoyed. I don't think any other Byzantine emperor has done anything so reprehensible. You have to go all the way back to Constantine I, who killed his son and wife, and his son Constantius, who massacred the princes, to find something comparable. I wasn't behind the microphone for those events, but I'd like to think that I would have poured suitable scorn on those despicable decisions. Mother or father, to murder your own children is entirely reprehensible. Even Theophanes, fresh off calling her the pious Irene for restoring the icons, feels the need to frown upon this, but he could hardly change his narrative of triumph sufficiently to fully condemn her. Irene would continue to rule for another five years. The Byzantines accepted her as their sole ruler, an unprecedented moment in Roman history. The girl who had made her way through those endless palace ceremonies was now a woman who would not be ruled by anyone. Her ruthless pursuit of power had reached its natural conclusion. But, be careful what you wish for. By murdering her son, she had destroyed her future. She had no one to succeed her now, and therefore everyone thought, why not me? Irene's trusted advisers will turn on one another, desperate to be the one to secure the throne for their friend or their relative. Power had lured her to commit the darkest of sins, but now that she'd committed it, power had moved on to find its next victim. Next time, we'll conclude the 8th century narrative as Irene's sole rule is undermined by the search for the next emperor. Eventually, the hunt will consume Irene herself. After all, what did loyalty really mean to a woman who turned on her own child? Thanks for listening, and if you have any questions for the end of the century, send them in now.